I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I actually forgot to make an episode, so we're doing one a little bit on the shorter side, a little bit on the quicker side. But I have plenty of episodes made in the future, but today I just had a gap in the uh, release schedule and didn't realize it until late in the afternoon. We were very busy this morning actually showing uh, someone from the channel a house, uh, which is always fun to do. Get to go out and see what they're doing just to make sure you understand. I do not show houses like a real estate agent. I just know where there's houses and people and sometimes drive them around and talk about houses. I do not get involved in buying or selling uh, for people at all. Just I just like talking about houses so that is that is the uh that's the quick we're just gonna go to the bump and we're gonna get to today's episode It's Wednesday here as I'm recording, and it's probably Wednesday as you're watching this as well as I'm making it in the absolute last second. I do sometimes rush episodes out, but you know what? It's Wednesday. It's a bright and quite warm day, and uh, we get our lowest viewership on Wednesday, so we're going to do a little bit more of an ad hoc episode today. I do have a number of topics queued up, but they take time to like think about, and I want to make sure we record them really well. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of ramble today a little bit. No, I'm kidding. I am actually going to talk about something that came up uh, very recently. Just a few days ago, I was talking to Valentina, who does my thumbnails. She's Mexican. She grew up in the Yucatan, but she lives in Buenos Aires, Argentina now. And one of the things that uh, we were talking about, just some amount of American culture, and she's pretty familiar because her mother lives in the United States. So she spends holidays there and visits quite a bit, but she grew up in Mexico. And uh, something that we've really noticed from, you know, her perspective in Mexico, her perspective in Argentina, my perspective in Nicaragua and Panama, uh, different places that we've lived and visited. Uh, one of the things that, that actually really stands out, and I don't think that very many Americans and Canadians think about this because it's not something you would think about. If you grow up in North America, something that we do, and this is actually, we were talking about what it's like being a teenager in America. And I was saying that it's a really common thing, especially back in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands, that if you were dating as a teenager, one of the things you would do is just find a uh, quiet living room with a TV and sit on the couch and watch TV together as a date, probably not a first date, but it was a really common thing for teenagers to do on dates. And she commented about how weird Americans are that like dating is so casual and people stay home and they don't go out and like such a thing. And it struck us. So we started talking about how so much of North American culture is actually defined by this general habit of not going out that often. Of course, people go out and, and they go out to eat and they do all kinds of things. But one, when they do go out to eat, often it's fast food or something that they either bring home or do very quickly uh, or they, they it's a special occasion. The idea that you would go out all the time is not very common. Of course, some people do, some people can, like that's fine. But very, very commonly you expect certain things like people will watch a certain number of movies and they'll watch a lot of television. You almost assume that at the end of the day after someone has worked, they're gonna go home and eat dinner and watch some TV. They might do some other things, but that's what people do. Or maybe they play video games, but staying home is the expectation. It is the norm for the average day. And so much of American life is focused on making your home comfortable, large, uh, full of things that you'll use while you're there, often things you'll use while you watch television, having TVs in lots of rooms. It just, that kind of culture is really big in North America. And when you come to other parts of the world, those things actually are much smaller and that may make sense when you see it, if you witness it, it, it doesn't seem weird, I don't think in most cases, for North Americans to experience that, but they don't necessarily stop and think about it and articulate it. And one of the things that, that's really interesting about this, I think, is that uh, I think in North America, you have this really high rate of going out is very expensive. Even though income levels are quite high, the cost of going out to a meal, to a show, anything like that is very expensive. This is a big investment to go out. Whereas uh, if you're here in Central America, for example, but most of the world, this is the norm, not the exception, food at like a restaurant is only a small premium over the cost of food from a grocery store. And uh, Americans, of course, Canadians, they, they tend to have big kitchens with lot big refrigerators. It's very easy to cook and prepare meals at home. It, they have a lot of space for that. In much of the world, it is common for home kitchens to have very few appliances. Uh, just recently, someone I know from here, it's, it's completely normal 
for someone who's not worked in a commercial kitchen, if you're not like a chef at a restaurant or something like that, it is not uncommon for a Nicaraguan family to never own an oven. Baking bread at home, not something that's done. But panaderias are around every corner, so you can always go get fresh bread. That's not a problem, and it's really cheap, just like in Europe. But because of that, you don't need an oven for baking. A lot of the traditional foods aren't done in an oven, and so microwaves are very common because microwaves are small and cheap, and they're very convenient for a lot of things. Uh, a little cook top where you're able to put a skillet on or a pot and make soup or something, those exist, often in electric form or often in gas form, but they're just range tops. They don't have anything under them, no oven. To actually have an oven here, even a toaster oven or air fryer, is pretty uncommon. Not so uncommon as to be surprised to see one, but to not see one in a home is completely normal. And to have people who go their entire lives without ever experiencing one firsthand, completely normal. Even people that we have hired as cooks generally don't know how to light an oven or how to use a stove. The entire thing is something they, they aren't familiar with they don't have them in their homes. They didn't have them growing up or anything like that. And in this case, she had a toaster oven, like a big one that kind of functions like an oven. And she went to reheat some food because she didn't have a microwave where she was. And she put the food in in a plastic container and melted the whole thing together into a big clump, uh, which, of course, ruined the food. Luckily, it was on a metal tray, so it didn't ruin the oven in any way. But it was a whole thing. It didn't occur to her that the entire oven would get super hot. Of course, if she had stopped and thought about it, I'm sure she would have known. But because she's used to microwaves and not used to ovens at all, it never even occurred to her that there were materials she couldn't put into the oven. Just like you wouldn't put a fork into a microwave, you don't put a styrofoam takeout container into an oven. But that's habit that we are used to because we always have ovens in North America, always. I've never seen a house without an oven. I can't imagine a house without an oven. The idea that someone would have a house without an oven seems absurd. Ovens are included with every apartment, with every house. You, you basically couldn't claim a place is move-in ready if it didn't have an oven in North America. People would think you were crazy. But if you come to Latin America, there's actually regions where having an oven would be like, what a unique feature. An oven in the house? Wow. That's, and when you do have things like that, sometimes they're outside on, uh, because they, they, you know, they'll heat up the house or whatever. So little things like that really add up that the, the North American experience has a tendency to be big houses that are super comfortable and designed for you to spend the majority of your time inside the house. And much of the rest of the world, especially here in Nicaragua, so much of life is completely the opposite. The cost of going out being so low, even in, in relationship to the low incomes, means it's really easy to go out to eat, out for drinks, to go out and see shows or whatever, and, and going out for walks and just everything is very easy the idea that you would have a big house that's designed for you to stay home and, and unless it's entertaining people right if you have uh, a bit more money and you you have a house where you're going to invite people over a lot uh, then you may have an entertaining space and that absolutely makes a lot of sense but in America, in the United States, and in Canada, if you're going to have a big house, uh, often you're going to focus it on the ability to watch TV in multiple rooms. Of course, some people are going to have really nice eating areas and really nice cooking areas and, and other common spaces where it makes it easy to hang out. But generally, those spaces are going to have televisions. Generally, those spaces are going to be able to be used to watch a sporting event. You're going to do something that everybody's focused on in most cases. And in Nicaragua, the opposite is true. Most of the spaces where you're going to entertain won't have televisions. They won't have a center thing for everyone to, to look at. Everyone is there to talk to each other. It is a much more social thing and obviously much less expensive in that way. Uh, but and you're more likely to use the space in your house for, for example, additional uh, sleeping quarters. So what's pretty easy to find in Nicaragua, a home with five, six, seven bedrooms. I mean, they're not around every corner, but they're completely normal. But you go to the United States and finding a six or seven bedroom house is actually incredibly hard. People have smaller families. They don't tend to live with extended families. They don't tend to have uh, in-law suites. All those things exist from time to time. Um, servants' quarters, all those things are not generally included in normal houses. You could go a lifetime without ever being in a house that has any of those, and no one would think anything of it. But in Nicaragua, even people from very poor areas are likely going to experience houses that are much larger with many more bedrooms on a regular basis, but many fewer entertaining and especially entertainment rooms. That is generally uncommon because the focus is people and going out instead of devices and staying in. 
And of course, it is the cost of going out in America more than anything that creates this. It's not that Americans and Canadians aren't social or wouldn't like to go out, but the it, it, there's a lot of things that do this. But the cost of going out is one. And one of the things that contributes to the cost of going out isn't just that food is expensive, isn't just that tips are an absurd percentage uh, that is expected of meals, right? It's, it's easy to pay 20 or 25% in tips. If you have a $100 meal, that's a $25 kicker on the end of that that just adds so much cost to going out. Whereas if you were to go out for the same meal in Nicaragua, you would expect to spend only $20 or $30 on the food instead of 100 And then the tip is only 10%, so 2 or $3 instead of 25 Things add up really quickly and make for a completely different experience. And when beer is a dollar, dollar fifty instead of five dollars or ten dollars. Again, you, 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 going out once in America, you don't really notice. Uh, sure, you complain about the price, but it's not a big deal. But when you start doing it as a, well, we could go out five nights a week, six nights a week, it starts being an astronomic cost. But in Nicaragua, you start doing that five or six days a week, and you still notice, but it's not very expensive. And it takes most of a week of going out to equal that one meal in America or whatever. But that's only the first piece. That is the raw cost. That's what we think of most of the time. But it's also, here in Nicaragua, most people are able to go out quite well with either walking distance or a very quick, easy taxi ride from where they live. The need for a, a designated driver in order to be able to drink, not very common, simply because you're not driving uh, at all. Uh, the idea that you have to spend a lot of time traveling to a bar or a restaurant in order to go out and hang out with friends, not very common. Everything is so close and people go out in their own neighborhoods. But the United States is designed around having residential areas and then having to travel quite some distance to get to a place to eat. Of course, then taxis or Ubers tend to be quite expensive. So that either adds a tremendous cost onto going out or you have to find a designated driver who's willing to take people. And then you have someone who's not participating if everyone else is drinking, it creates a lot of complications or it encourages people to drink and drive, of course. That is assumed to be part of the design. Many of the things since the 19, uh, 1920s were designed, uh, socially engineered to, to create a desire to drink in dangerous situations in the United States. No one knows why. Uh, the organizations push so hard to create an addictive design where it makes driving and alcohol naturally combined. Everywhere else in the world has worked really, really hard to make it obvious that you don't need a car at times that you have alcohol. And the United States has gone ex to extreme degrees through zoning, through through uh, prohibition laws to try to make alcohol something that is highly desired, unregulated, and, and kept at very far distances so that people are forced into cars while providing very poor public transportation. Uh, so it just, it's so unbelievably well engineered to create the worst possible scenario. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's neither good for lifestyles. It's not good for safety. It's not good for families. It, it, it creates alcoholism. And of course, those things do drive alcohol sales. So, you know, it's, it's often believed that prohibition was actually an attempt to create an addiction to both alcohol and drugs in the United States. Uh, because it was every, you know, there's no way you could do that and not think it was going to cause those problems. Even back then, it was completely obvious that this was not a solution to anything. If you and it's ever since the United States has followed that engineering principle, uh, and now is starting to reverse some things. They reversed alcohol a while ago. Now they're starting to reverse marijuana as those things have become more obvious to the public as being problems in the way that they're prohibited. But the overall problem of not having social spaces close to residential areas in North America continues. Uh, and that makes for an expensive and time consuming, not just not just money being spent, but I'll, and a lot of it because each of these pieces adds up instead of a, a normal going out to a meal here, excluding the time actually in the meal. If you want to go to a restaurant, well, quite often I can get there in five to 10 minutes from the time I walk out my door. Just say, oh, do you want to go to a restaurant? Now, yeah, just walk out my door. I don't have to get in a car or anything. I just walk. I'll be at a local neighborhood restaurant and then sit down and eat and hang out and walk home. And there's no cost to going there. It only took, you know, 20 minutes total of my own time. But if I'm going to do the same thing in the United States, even if I'm going very, very close, once you have to get in that car, it may take me 10 minutes to get the family together and get out the door because you got to get everyone into the car and just get everything ready and then drive to the place and park and get out and go in. And each of those things is like, well, that's so trivial, but it adds up when it's part of every single interaction. And that's one of the reasons why people don't tend to bar hop in the United States. They go to a place, it's isolated, it's in a big parking lot, and then you go on somewhere else. Of course, there's exceptions. But here it is extremely standard to go to one place. And when that place is done, everybody says, oh, where's the group going? And everybody just walks over to another place that's around the corner. And you can go from place to place and have this ongoing social thing 
on a regular basis uh, that requires no driving, that requires no coordination, is safe and effective and fast. And so you're not spending all this time moving from place to place. It's not uncommon if you're going from dinner to some bar in the United States that you could spend 30 to 60 minutes moving a group between those places. And if you have people who are in different vehicles, it could go up even more. It gets very complicated. And, and this, you don't really think about how that affects every single ex, uh, 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 interaction and experience experience that you have outside of the home in North America, whereas in, in many other countries like Nicaragua, the, it's so well lubricated for moving from a uh, frictionless from your home to the p entertainment to food uh, and back again and with groups and just it, it's completely different things. So these things add up that you spend a, a huge amount of time and a huge amount of effort and possibly a, a bit of risk in going out in the United States? Are you going to be traveling back when everyone's on the road and has been drinking? Are you with people who are probably going to drive after they've been drinking? These things add up to make you in a more dangerous situation uh, to potentially, you know, life altering, terrible things can happen. Of course, it can always happen, but so much more likely when you're in a situation where you, what are you going to do? You have to get home. Are you going to spend a bunch of money on a cab? Are you going to trust the person who says they haven't had too much to drink? Are you going to trust all the other people on the road who haven't had too much to drink? It doesn't matter if you're sober when everyone else is drunk. And we just had a terrible accident, as I'm saying this, realized 40 people sent to hospital from an accident from a DUI in Florida last night. Like this is very common. The same thing here in Nicaragua. Can it happen? Of course it can. But the chances that you're on the road, fractional. The chances that there's a drunk driver, fractional. Each of those things makes it so much safer in that regards. And accidents tend to happen much more slowly here, but that's a completely different issue. So that is something that that nobody ever talks about how the the society of North America is so home facing and everything from the cost to the style of the homes to the entertainment and the investment that we have inside our homes uh, is both creates that situation, but is because of the cost of going out. And in Nicaragua, everything is reversed. And, and having that as a mental tool, as this kind of like understanding of uh, Latin American culture that, oh, going out is normally a very affordable thing. When we, when we're, whenever I'm visiting the United States, we say, oh, do we want to go out? And immediately everyone's like, okay, it costs so much to go out. It's such an investment to go to a restaurant, to have someone prepare the food and deal with the tip. And it's a, it's a mental thing that everyone, like there's a discussion about the tip and it's so much money that no one wants to do it, but no one wants to be the one who doesn't do it. And it just, everything is stressful and expensive. And everyone it's like, okay, how are we going to get there? How are we going to get back? How are we going to keep people coordinated? And we don't have that in, in normal everyday interactions in Nicaragua. Uh, and, and, it's such an interesting disparity in in culture, but one that is uh, very difficult to change. You can't just move uh, Latinos into the United States and magically have that culture change because they bring it with them or vice versa. To some degree, you can bring an American culture to Nicaragua without too much of a problem because you simply don't go out. You can buy Plenty of TVs here. You can make a big kitchen. You can put in a big fridge. You can order in lots of food. You can stock your house however you like and have it well prepared for you to stay home and do things like you would in North America. It's not a particular problem. There's a few things that aren't as easy. It's difficult to get furniture and houses that are designed in the same kind of comfy stay at home to just watch TV kind of way that they do in North America because North American living rooms are really well designed for that at this point. And having, you know, room, <laughs> room to room, wall to wall carpeting big comfy furniture that you're going to lounge in and spend the evening not moving is very much how, how life is designed. You expect that in most houses. Uh, whereas in Nicaragua, you tend to have much less comfortable furniture because it's expected that you only sit in it for a little while. You get up and move around all the time. You have tile floors because you need to. It's the tropics. You don't put carpeting in the tropics uh, in normal under normal conditions. Um, and you don't have all those TVs and stuff. And in North America, typically the TVs are actually quite a bit cheaper. Uh, so you're just that much easier to put one into every room, have bigger ones, have the center of things. It, video game consoles are cheaper as a percentage of income, even though the actual cost is about the same. Uh, so these things add up that in North America, the even if you want to do the same thing, it's actually a little bit easier to stay home in North America than it is in Nicaragua, but only a little bit. It's very easy to have a, to replicate an at-home life in Nicaragua. And of course, all your other costs are lower. So it, it still is cheaper by a landslide. 
I do want to point out somebody, again, every so often, someone tries to tell me that Nicaragua is expensive. This time, someone said that uh, there's very little you can buy for under, and they said 40 cord, which is about a dollar 40 ish. Um, that's actually not a dollar 40. Uh, 37 cord is a dollar, so it's much closer to a dollar nine. But saying that, there aren't enough things he can buy for a dollar nine. Therefore, Nicaragua is expensive. Now, I don't know what things he can't buy for a dollar nine. That's a very strange way of saying it. But imagine if you're in the United States and said, I can't buy enough things for one dollar. Therefore, the United States is expensive. The U.S. is generally considered expensive, but not because things cost more than a dollar. The dollar is an arbitrary numerical currency value. It means nothing on its own. When you start saying there aren't many things available for a dollar, that doesn't make in any way does that describe expensive or cheap because the only thing you're comparing is the value of the dollar. It's saying how strong the currency is. It doesn't tell you whether the items are expensive or cheap. That dollar could be worth a you know, single gram of gold or it could be worth a kilogram of gold. You don't know because the dollar is just an arbitrary designation. It's meaningless. And, and if you think about it, how many things could you buy for a dollar in the 1800s? And how many things can you buy for a dollar today? Well, completely different amounts, but that almost all things are cheaper today by a huge amount. And the, the way that you generally compare things to know if they're expensive or cheap over time is not to compare it to an arbitrary, meaningless number on a piece of paper, but to compare it to something that doesn't really change, which is generally an hour of human labor. So if you're doing an hour of manual labor, which does vary a little bit depending on the job you're doing and, and compared to other jobs at the time, but it's a relatively standard measurement of value in a way that matters to humans. It is, in fact, the only thing that is standard. Gold fluctuates compared to an, uh, an hour of human labor, but human labor is always human labor. You can go back millions of years and taking a person for an hour and having them do a task for you requires a certain amount of remuneration, and that value doesn't change. It is called an hour for a reason. And I love that the currency from Ithaca, New York was known as the Ithaca hour because it was based on one hour of unskilled manual labor value. And so you actually spoke in hours. So if you needed two, two hours for one hour of work, it means you were valuing your own time at double that of unskilled manual labor, which is a completely reasonable thing to do. If you think about minimum wage, which is supposed to be roughly the same thing and someone who gets paid double that, well, that's why, right? It's, it's that kind of uh, mental experiment. And so understanding that and saying, okay, how many hours of labor did you have to work to be able to buy a car in 1920 versus now? Oh, many fewer, right? Yes, the, the actual numerical number might be higher, but we can buy cars today, very nice cars for $10,000. That's only like several hundred dollars in the early 1900s and very few cars were selling at that price. Computers are a tiny fraction today of what they were in the 1970s. Things are cheaper generally, you can get way more with your money today than you could before based on the amount of hours it takes you to accumulate that money doing the same level of tasks. So using something like, well, I can't buy something with a dollar doesn't mean anything except that you don't understand what cheap, expensive, or currency mean. And is just, but the th how anyone can say that the cheapest country or second cheapest in the Western Hemisphere, depending on how you compare it to Colombia, is expensive, just doesn't make any sense. When cheap is expensive, what is everything else? Right? The, the idea that we're trying to label the cheapest places as expensive, like cheap is defined by being less costly than the average. And Nicaragua was way below the average. Now, I understand when someone's really poor, they will perceive the world is expensive because they can't afford the things that they want. But just because you can't afford things that you want doesn't mean that those things cost a lot, that they're expensive. Expensive is relative to other things. Now you can say, you know, today apples are expensive compared to 10 years ago. Maybe the price has gone up. An apple here is expensive compared to an apple somewhere else. Okay, it is regionally expensive. Sure, uh, you can compare a uh, apple is expensive compared to an orange. Well, I can buy a load of oranges. I can eat those all day long, but I can't afford to eat an apple. Okay, apples are an expensive fruit. You can have an expensive location, all those things. But just saying that arbitrarily, anything that costs over a dollar is expensive and therefore all of the world is expensive is is utterly nonsense. And, and, and you can tell how desperate people are to try to make Nicaragua sound bad, that these are the kinds of lengths that they have to go to to try to come up with something negative to say. It's super weird. 
anyways, I just wanted to kind of go into this topic because it was such an interesting conversation that we had and a realization that this was um, the, the cost and, and the obviously the, the zoning uh, that they do in North America creates the situation to some degree, but also those things work. You're able to have really expensive food and have crazy zoning because people are generally focused on staying home. It is, it is the American culture uh, and nothing wrong with that. It's just important to understand when you're comparing to other places. Why do houses look so differently? Why is lifestyle so different? Why are the ways that people spend their money so different? And why do, does so much of the world who quote unquote earn so much less than the United States seem to have so much more buying power? Why are Nicaraguans who make a tiny fraction in raw numbers compared to the United States able to afford to go out and do a lot of activities that Americans feel they can't afford to do at home? That's really important questions that people need to ask and reasons why Nicaraguans who know how things work in North America often question why Americans think that they're so rich and Nicaragua is so poor. Clearly, in purely raw ec economic numbers, we all know that is true. Salaries are much higher abroad, but what that salary buys is often much less or much closer than you would expect. And these are some of the reasons why that that happens and some of the reasons why people are confused about that because it goes both directions. The, the two things feed off of each other. Anyway, it's a Wednesday, so hope you enjoyed a kind of off the cuff and very different topic today. Uh, tomorrow, we have a cool anniversary we're going to be talking about. And Friday, hopefully, if all goes well, we have some really awesome footage coming out. I, I have three episodes planned to all release on Friday. So if you guys could make a point of being online Friday, like all day, we're going to try to hit a whole bunch of stuff. And it's going to be super interesting. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Hopefully, I get them all out. I do have them recorded. I just messed up on my scheduling a little bit. So I apologize for that. But thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller, or I could use it to buy a beer. I do like having Tonya's as well. And we can afford them here in Nicaragua. The, it's not as much as is buying a beer somewhere else. If you would be so kind as to share this on social media, tell a friend about the show. I know that our recent retirement episode got a lot of new people were interested because early retirement is a really exciting topic, of course, for people who are almost at retirement and then having an episode that tells them they might actually be at retirement if they so choose is a pretty good bit of news for most people. So hope you guys are enjoying the show. I will see all of you tomorrow. And we're going to throw four episodes up on the, on the screen. If you would be so kind as to click on one of those, and even if you just let it play in the background, I'd really appreciate it.